hopefully you kind of noticed the manuf uh, manufacturing of aggregates, like the sales guy was talking about. There's a lot of different things aggregates can be used for, not just not just concrete. Um, and so aggregates, lots of different geologies, most limestone or dolomite, uh, both are very similar. They're both calcium carbonates, just there's some magnesium in the dolomite. So a lot of times you just call both of these limestone. There is a difference, but um, you can also have river gravel. So when people say, oh, that's a gravel driveway, um, a lot of times they'll use gravel to talk about limestone and stuff, so you kind of have to be careful. But it's actually, when you say the word gravel, it's actually like a river gravel you get out of a river, not a crushed you know, limestone out of a quarry. This is a manufactured sand, so it's the limestone crushed up really fine. Um, this is a natural sand that you actually get out of a river too. And then a lightweight aggregate, um, they can be clay or slate and stuff like that. At the very end of the presentation, I have a little bit more about lightweight, but it's actually a man-made product. Um, so you take clay or slate or something and then actually put it in a kiln, which is a hot oven and you melt it down. So the geology of the United States, there's a lot of uh, sand and limestone um, and there's quite a bit of granite in different places, depending on where you're at. Oklahoma does have some pretty good aggregate production, uh, depending on what year you're looking at. Sometimes they are in the top 10 in the United States at producing aggregates. Um, south of Oklahoma City, uh, Davis, Oklahoma, Mill Creek, Oklahoma, um, they actually quarry limestone daily and ship it all the way up to Kansas City because uh, they have really bad aggregates up there, really bad uh, crushed limestone that cause ASR issues. So they will pay $3 more for a yard of concrete just to get good, good Oklahoma rock. Um, Texas is actually, in California, are usually their big states, but they usually have Usually they're within the top three in the in the country for many years. And, and Oklahoma's a lot of times is in the top 10. This is a huge industry. Um, the quality control is not as good as it needs to be, but um, it is a it is a good industry to be in. There's very few river gravel sources in Oklahoma. Um, just to kind of you know realize most of this is sand for Oklahoma that's being produced. Um, we have a lot of a lot of limestone and dolomite, and we do have, you know, a pretty decent amount of sand and, and river gravel. Um, this is kind of what it looks like if you look at the geologies in Oklahoma. Um, kind of, this is kind of a little bit of of where it's at. So um, there's some limestone up here. There's also quite a few random quarries. There's some limestone and sandstone up here too. Um, and then down over, down over here, some good aggregate quarries, some good rock quarries. And then over in the Lawton area, there's some good, some good quarries too. So these are all the different approved aggregate sources, whether it is for sand or for rock, for, for, for coarse stone. Lamar, Colorado is one of the few sources that's approved for river gravel. Some of these other ones up here are actually approved because you have precast facilities for concrete. And so um, they need to get their stuff approved so they can ship beams in, um, I-beams and other things for, br for bridges into the state of Oklahoma. But kind of west of Tulsa or east of Tulsa, there's some pretty good um, rock sources on the Arkansas River here, south of Tulsa, there's some good sources for sand. Out here is mainly sand sources. Um, over here north of Amarillo is actually uh, sand and gravel. They have both and it's pretty good. And then over here, um, you're looking a little bit more at rock in these areas. Um, but I think there are some down here, obviously in the Red River is some sand sources. So. And then down here, there's uh, some sand, and I want to say there might be one river gravel source down here. So that's kind of where it where it looks at. Looks. So this is the overview of a, of an aggregate quarry. So this is 
where they actually take the the aggregate, you know, and blow it up, and then they process it here over in this area. So this is an old, these ponds here are actually old quarry beds. And this one up there is too. I think this is actually over in uh, Davis, Oklahoma, which is one of the largest in the state. So you're gonna blast it, and then you're gonna haul it, and you take it through a primary crusher to, to initially crush the, the rock to make it kind of make it smaller. Then you're gonna put it on screens. It's kind of like a sieve. And you're gonna separate out the sizes that you want. And so things you don't want, you're gonna to put to a secondary crusher and you're gonna break them down even farther. Depending on the geology and the primary crusher, um, that depends on how small these particles are gonna be. Um, so you may even have a tiny area, third crusher, to crush things down even farther depending on what your setup is. Um, but you take them through different crushers and then it goes to screening process and then they'll get put in different bins. And a lot of times you'll, you'll actually um, measure out these different bins with these different sizes to make a product for a customer. Sometimes they just go from these, they don't even have bins and they just go straight to products depending on how the screens are. So um, blasting. So my great grandpa retired from the Tulsa rock quarry and um, he was a blasting expert. He's one of the last of his kind where he actually worked for the rock quarry. Um, normally um, blasting experts will actually go in and um, um, or a separate company for liability purposes. And so, uh, so it's kind of cool. You know, they saw some slow-mo of, of uh, the quarry being blasted. It's important to realize that whenever you're blasting or you're crushing anything that's, that you're trying to break rock, um, you want to take a nice, small, um, very detailed area and break the rock or do you want to take a broad impact because the detailed impacts they can actually chisel out exactly what you want a very broad like a sledgehammer can you know break a huge area but it doesn't get the details that you kind of want and so what you what happens is um, if you're blasting you're going to get um, you know you may get something like this where it shatters and you have a variety of different uh, particles or it may have something like an abrasion where you know it blasts a certain area and you, you may just have you know kind of chips um, a certain area so you kind of have to realize um, how controlled do you want to get the size um, for your products so initial stage is kind of a grizzly that will it's, it's a standard like kind of looks like little bars and it rejects things that are just too too big in size to go through that primary crusher. The primary crusher kind of looks like that. We have these large sizes. This is a jaw crusher, which is probably the most common type, and it just works like that. And it crushes those rocks down into smaller um, bits. This is an impact crusher, which is um, pretty common too. And this little thing here rotates and to crush uh, the particles. This is a cone crusher, so it actually squeezes upward and it crushes the particles. This can be used as a secondary crusher too. Um, it just depends on, you know, what, what your preferences are and what particles you're trying to, trying to break. So the screening process, like I said, it's kind of like we think of it as a sieve. Um, there, here's, you know, your screen and you have conveyor belts going out. So after you get done with the uh, your crusher, it goes down and then it hits the screens. And so there's different beds. There might be three or four, five, depending on how big it is, or maybe even one or two. It, it just depends on um, what screens that, that are at your, at your plant. So that's kind of what a, a setup looks like. It's at an incline or it's at a decline and it shakes up and down and then the particles fall through it. So you don't want to have, kind of like I talked about with overloading, you don't want to overload a screen. You want to have a certain amount and you have to have a certain length. So there's kind of a balance there. So uh, the quality control at these aggregate facilities are, are you have to be very detailed. 
Um, and they output all sorts of different things. You saw the salesman in that video talk about all the different things that um, the Crusher output with the different products. And so that's kind of what you see here. Um, some of these are good for concrete, some are not. Some are good for like aggregate base. Um, and that's why we have like ASTM C33, which we went over and talked about for gradation. So you have the right particle distribution. Um, another thing that's really important is you need to wash your rock or your sand um, after you crush it because a lot of times it creates dust. You don't want to have large amounts of dust because it can lower your strengths of your concrete and it can mess up your air and, and other performance issues. So you got to kind of have to be careful. So there's the quarry, there's the crusher, screening area, then you have your different products. A lot of times those products will be in stockpiles. Um, here is a, another look. So the quarry is back over there. You have the grizzly starting off, primary crusher, screening area, secondary crusher, and then you have another screening area, second, and then you have another secondary crusher or primary crusher, and you have another screening area. So this is a um, pit north of Amarillo, sand and gravel operation, um, one of my buddy zones. And this is kind of what it looks like. Very similar where you're going to extract it, then you're going to screen it, and you may wash it. For your gravel, you're going to probably, you might, you're probably going to crush it and put it in your product. For the sand, you may just, you know, screen it and, and wash it and maybe screen it again. For pea gravel, the smaller pea gravel, you may just wash it and screen it. So it, it again, it just depends on what your product. Some some sand source or some sources only have sand. Some only really have coarse agri or coarse gravel. So it, it just depends. Closer you are to mountains, normally the closer you are to, to coarser rock and then less sand. So, um, well, like like in Oklahoma, a lot of times they'll drudge the river where they have a boat, and they will actually scoop up sand, like you see the buckets there, um, and then they will actually convey it over and um, wash it and screen it and everything on land. Um, the gravel, the, the pit over in Amarillo, they just used a front end loader to do all theirs. Um, and they would just put it in, in the screening and sieving operation. Sand is a big deal to be washed. Um, this is over in Dover, Oklahoma. It's the sand you guys used yesterday in your lab. So you dredge the river or dredge the pond there. You have your product and you know, this is after you screen it. So you dredge the river send it over to the screen area, and then you have your product. So ASTM C33, you have your gradations. Uh, for, for coarse aggregate, you also have weathering, for especially for free thaw resistance, like I talked about yesterday. Um, there's three different categories, what they have. This is very, very old, like 1950s. Um, but down this very, very far south coastal areas, um, it focuses more on there's not really any weathering regions, but whenever you start getting temperature differences, um, like in Oklahoma, we actually have a winter. Um, some places down in Houston may not ever see snow or very few times in 100 years. So they have, they have very, you know, they don't have harsh winters, severe winters or anything. So when you get past really Oklahoma, um, go farther north, you start getting to very severe, severe weather um, for, you know, differences in temperature. So um, there's some specs for that. There's also specs for um, the material. So for chert and lignite and sulfate and stuff like that, it's all in there in abrasion. So of course, uh, so for ASTM C33, it's not just gradation, but there are other parameters that are specced in that. So we talked about this yesterday. Um, you really need to know the number 57 and 67 stone. So the nominal maximum size of a, of a 57 is one inch. 67 is three quarters of an inch. So nominal maximum is whenever you have sieves, you put your product in there, 
and the sieve shake and that first one to retain any material is, an, is the nominal maximum size. So um, kind of realize that for the, so for the spec for ASTM C33, you can have something retained on the 57 on the one inch or the 67, which is three quarters of an inch. So um, that's why they're referred to as 57 as a, as a nominal maximum of one inch and a 67 of three quarters of an inch. Um, I already talked about that. You can kind of see this is severe up here. This is more of like a moderate where you don't have as many, you know, freezing and thawing cycles. And then this down here, you very rarely as it ever freeze. Um, like I talked about yesterday. So for concrete aggregates, you have what it's being used for, whether it's a footing or a column or architectural concrete, decorative, what, you know, you kind of read all these to figure out uh, which one kind of fits your needs. And you can look at um, sulfate, abrasion, and we'll go over some of these. The percent finer than the number 200, clay, chert, uh, clay lumps. Um, and, in, and it breaks it down into three different ones. So you have the region where you have almost no, uh, you know, freezing and thawing cycles to you have some, like you have in Oklahoma, to whenever you go north of Oklahoma, um, when it gets more severe weathering. So for fine aggregate, again, you have your gradation, which is just one gradation for fine aggregate. It's very basic. Um, the fineless modulus is between 2.3 and 3.1, so make sure you have that. Make sure you realize that. It's also important to recognize that for many, this is also for whether it's natural sand or manufactured sands. Um, the standard is, is for both. Um, and then you also have your, your impurities and stuff for, for sand. When we talk about lightweight aggregate, um, this is, you can, lightweight aggregate has a lot of issues when it talks about moisture. So you got to realize, um, here it's ponded. So water actually falls into, into the, into this bed and they'll get a front end loader and pick it up. And so they try to have it completely saturated with water everywhere. And then the lightweight aggregate here, they get a sprinkler head that's sprinkling down. It's not doing a great job, but it is there. Um, how you use lightweight aggregate, how it's produced, is it's very similar to thinking about like with the quarry at the beginning. You're going to crush, whether it's clay or chert or slate, uh, or not chert, uh, clay or slate. Um, you're going to crush it down. And then you're going to put it through this hot oven called a kiln. And then when it comes out the other side, it looks completely different. You're going to crush it again into the size that you need for your product. So you're going to screen it, um, screen it down to the product that you need. So lightweight aggregate has half the weight of a typical rock and sand. So you can replace either the rock or the sand with lightweight aggregate, depending on what you want to do. So for second story buildings, there a lot of times they're going to be um, lightweight aggregate because they're a lot, but a lot less in weight. So you can actually get away with smaller columns, uh, smaller beams. But whenever you deal with lightweight aggregate, it's important to realize these, these aggregates suck in. I mean, they look like little, um, if you ever go out and you grill out and you have the, the rock, the little lava, lava rock that's in the grill, they're very, very porous. That's what the, the larger rocks look like. And so they really retain a lot of water. So they dry out real easy. So a lot of times you got to make sure that they're, they're moistened at the right, uh, at the right amount, or you're going to have a lot of uh, issues. A lot of strength issues, a lot of times batching out. So you got to really check your yields. So these are four different types of lightweight aggregate. Again, they're produced in a certain spot and then they're shipped all over the United States. 
So this is slate. These are two shells. And then there's a clay. These are probably the four most commonly used um, lightweight aggregate sources I've seen in the United States. Um, 